Hello. Hello, good to see you. Yay. <laughs> Hmm. On this fine September first. <laughs> If you want to um, see everyone here, please look. So it can be helpful to um, close your eyes if you're comfortable with that and let your attention just, you're letting it settle around your body, around the surface of your skin. Often it's helpful to connect your attention with earth element where your sit bones are connecting with your cushion or bench or bed. Receiving the sensations there. Earth, element, hardness, softness, pressure. And sometimes it's helpful to just get in touch with our intention. To be kind. with whatever's appearing during the sitting, caring about any pain, a quiet care and tenderness that appears in the mind or body, heart, Appreciating any joy that appears. And to pick a, an unconditional peace. acceptance with whatever appears. We make the intention and then just see what happens during the sitting. Not trying to get anything or get rid of anything. For example, with the hearing. Just noticing that hearing is happening. Mm. 
Noticing if we can receive the textures and sounds directly. Being with, being with, being with, just as they're happening. Often there's a way that we pause the attention where it's like a subtle waiting. Not to go through the thought process, but to receive the sensation textures. Just as they're happening, just as they are. And it's a wonderful practice to notice if the thought about the sound appears, there's no problem. No need to demonize or get rid of thinking. A thought or thinking happens No need to yank the attention, just to you settle back in with receiving the textures, vibrations, just as they are. Including the textures and vibrations of silence. When we shift with hands, being with hands, sensations there. It's that same sense of, it's like a little bit of a pause or waiting for the unknown to appear and disappear moment by moment. Receiving the aliveness of the sensations there. Without any past memory. And of course, if the past memory appears as an image or thought, words, no problem. Just let them come and go by themselves. And it's like letting the attention, it's very delicate. Receive just what's appearing. right now. Being with the sensation. Not me, not mine. 
Not I. Just the settling, settling in with the movement of the breath. And that finding that delicacy of not controlling. just like catching a wave. We sometimes find the peace of the non-doing awareness. Just letting the movement come and go just as it is by itself. Sometimes naturally the attention will just start start shifting to a ease of dropping into that six sense door flow of awareness. And if we get lost in thinking, inevitably, inevitably, it's fine. You just drop into the flow of six sense store awareness. Or you can anchor with the movement of the breath or hands or sound for a while. Great. Allowing of things to be just as they are. The greatest kindness.
Uh, Jesse and I wanted to um, just take a, some time to uh, ask everyone to send some loving kindness to uh, Matt Hawkins, who died recently, was a beloved uh, person we all got to know very well in Honolulu and he was also a member of the Honolulu committee that did so much uh, work for arranging retreats and helping with retreats in Honolulu. Dear friend. So often when we practice this for our Sangha, some of you know him and some of you don't. It's it's just that sense of really um, wishing him well on his way. So often with metta, we, we get in touch with our deepest wishes for someone. And uh, sometimes it, we wait, we just pause and there are many wishes we can have for someone who has died. And then sometimes these deepest wishes appear. Wherever Matt is right now, in the next part of his journey, next form. So wishing him well in whatever way we might do silently or with phrases. May you be happy and peaceful of heart. May you be safe and protected. May you find ease of well being. If we want to help him a little more, we can offer him whatever merit we want to, just all of us sitting together, the goodness of that. We can share the goodness of practicing together now or any time. May we offer the goodness of our practice together to Matt on his journey. May you receive this loving kindness and well wishing fully, completely, boundlessly.
May you be happy and peaceful of heart. Thank you, Michelle. Oh, Michelle, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, Michelle and I thought we would have some time to take questions if anyone had them about your practice. Any way we can support this as usual, the best way to let us know at the, the bottom of your Zoom screen, if you move your mouse around, there's a button that says react. You can raise your hand there, type something into the chat or play all around and we'll see, hopefully. Actually, also I'll say before we get started, just because some folks don't stay the whole time, we'll make an announcement soon, but um, I am gonna be traveling back to Massachusetts in October. And um, on October 12th, is a Saturday, right? Let me double check that. Um, I, I'm gonna do a little day long retreat in, yes, um, Lawrence, Mass at Look Park. It's a little outdoor venue. So anyway, any Massachusetts people that are on here, we'll also send out an email, but just, we're sort of trying to figure out if we'll just do it as a Vipassana Hawaii thing or coordinate with uh, Insight Western Mass over there. But if you're in the area, uh, see you on October 12th, yeah. So any questions? See, so hold on one second. I feel like I have to unmute. Let's see, can you unmute there? Oh, here we go. So, Tan and I wanted to do a one month retreat at Tatagata Meditation Center, but as we're getting old and forget food. <laughs> Our son and daughter told me, no more traveling by yourself. So we plan to do a self-retreat at home. But I have a, I have failed so many times before. <laughs> Any tips? Are you trying to do it right now? <laughs> Supposed to do today, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> we have birthday celebration today yeah you could you could wait till january when we do the health retreat you'd have a lot more <laughs> structure but that's just a we can we can offer you tips if you're you, you could start, do both you, yeah you mm -hmm. could do both you started yesterday no what? we plan to do today start today september 1st like um the retreat at tmc start at september 1st uh -huh. for two months so uh, we couldn't go. So we thought maybe we can do it at home. 
but somehow like at home eh, today is Don's birthday, so we have to celebrate his birthday. <laughs> and then uh. Kim is coming for September is a birthday month. Kim is coming yeah. during yeah. your retreat. <laughs> <laughs> September 11, 10. Because, oh, yeah. That might be yeah. tricky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but this is, I, know, I guess you would already have said this if they don't, but are they, does TMC do any online part of their retreat? Does say it all, like, is any of it recorded or something like that? Uh, no. No, TMC has like um, only um, um, f uh, doesn't have anything for people at home. Mm -hmm. No, but they recorded the uh, they uh, they talk so we can try to listen to the drama talk, and we will try to sit uh, as much as we can and yeah, at, at least to be mindful during the day. That's what right. I I intend to do. Yeah, I mean, first of all, that's, I mean, if you, if they really are recording the talks and are going to let you all, if they'll send them to you or uh, have a way that you can listen to them, I mean, that provides some for sure, you know, I mean, I'm sure Michelle will say something similar of like, just that, how do you, how do you provide a little bit of structure to your day, you know, so that you are more likely to you know, be practicing. And then there's the formal and there's the informal, you know, and I know, you know, the two of you do a lot of that kind of mixed practice, but I, I know, Sun, that you sometimes feel like you don't, it's, it's much more on the informal side <laughs> and that you don't get like the kind of rigor of it, you know, I mean, I, I think then you have to probably be somewhat flexible of understanding that your daughter's going to come visit and, you know, you're not going to hold you're not going to hold a formal structure on your own in the same way that if you were at TMC. But I do think a little bit of structure so that if you have the talks at night, I think that's great. You know, you can listen to those. I'd say something that's just structuring the morning, the afternoon and the evening is like the basic. So it's like if you have at least one formal sitting period in each of those times, maybe one formal walking period in each of those times, that simply, you know, could be enough, you know, especially if you have to go grocery shopping or if you're going swimming or, you know, I mean, maybe is there a way that you can sort of say no to a few other obligations, you know, this month? Mm. I mean, that's the renunciation is part of it too, I guess, you know. Are, are like you Bodhi like Tree that? and the I don't know. Let, yeah, know. Letting, go of the, letting go of babysitting. Baby. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no babysitting, no teaching, no. <laughs> huh. And Kim, your daughter could join you for sittings and the talks, right? Yeah, right. I'm sure Kim would join us. And yeah. Knowing that we are on retreat, she right. will try to support us. Yeah. And um, I'm just wondering about whether we should go into going to Bodhi Tree to support their practice that we do two or three times a week. Should we continue that or should we just stop that during our retreat? It depends That's how the... quiet. If you want to have a real retreat, it depends how quiet you want to get. The less you do, the better, right? Like the, It's just how much you want to protect yourself. So that's a lot of even if it's Dhamma work, you're going out and you're talking versus staying quiet. So it, it's really de depends on how, how formal and serious you want your retreat. If you want to be really quiet, no. <laughs> if you you know, it's wanna... like in the winter when we go sit, yeah. you know, we just sort of other people hold the space and it is hard. It's like we know that that's, it's not the same for students mm -hmm. and for the sangha but on the other hand like i would say with you know your students and community at bodhi tree it's also good for people to be able to sit by themselves and not be always so teacher focused and you know and that it gives you that mm -hmm. there is that way that even if you're up in front of people and you're sitting together there energetically there is still um, a dynamic that is different mm -hmm. you're still presenting yourself in a way that's just not as quiet, never mind having to drive through traffic and 
you know, all the stuff that you'd have mm -hmm. to do. I would, I would definitely, just because you guys are so busy and full of responsibilities, I think it would be interesting to try what it would be like to just let other people take that on for the month and, and see what it's like mm -hmm. to just kind of be more settled, you know? Yeah, I yeah, was we thinking were trying, like, yeah. uh, we were the, trying. the schedule on that we, the Vipassana has been offering would be good. Yeah, maybe just at first that schedule. You mean just send you the schedule that we were doing before on the online retreats, you mean? Oh, I still keep it. The one that the Vipassana has every year. Mm. Right. Starting yeah. at six. Yeah, yeah, we could use that last yeah, no, uh, schedule. It's good. A schedule is really important. We'll send you it. That's great. No. Don't you think you should start at 3.30? No. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. We'll send yeah, you. I the... plan to start okay. at 6. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we usually That's get great. up around 6 so we can start around there. That's as soon great. as we get up, we will start. Good. And, uh... hmm. Yeah, and, sadu, sadu, sadu. The... Mm -hmm. yeah. and then we can all be sending you meta. Mm. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. And... Yeah. yeah. That's I think wonderful. Great. Yeah. Thank you all. There is a yeah. um, Brahma world. There's the all these different layers of existence, but in the Brahma world, which is supposedly better than the Meta Deva world, there is said to be no responsibilities. Which maybe I'm thinking about maybe trying to <laughs> apply the uh, uh, the way that people that practicing Chitta Nupasana that they're, they're doing, um, maybe that would be more workable, you know, watching the mind most of the time. And um, I don't think it's necessarily more workable. It depends on what you're inclined toward, Tan. And so, you know, like our bodies are always there doing things. And and so, and our minds are always doing things. And so, you right. know, that, that sense of like, it could be that um, whatever, especially at the beginning, I would, the first week I would do what's easiest. So, and often on a, a very interesting thing about self-retreat is often if you have a schedule, a, a kind of schedule emerges within that schedule and the kind of practice that, that you're inclining toward this retreat, that retreat will emerge. So I wouldn't have a heavy hand with it, but you start with something and then see what happens. And it could be that that's right, but it could be that that doesn't work at all. So just see, start with something. Yeah. All right, thank you, Michelle. Right. Go, and, I would definitely yeah. start start with something easy and maybe yeah. have have one Brahma Vihara sitting. Yeah, it's always yes, helpful it's... to have one Brahma. Yeah, we always do that in yeah. the evening. Yeah. yeah, we. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Well, we'll send the schedule and yep, whatever. Yeah. Oh, I, I keep the schedule. <laughs> I keep the schedule after every retreat and plan to do it by myself somehow. I I cannot do it. Without right. the sun yeah. Right. Maybe or two of us together. Maybe that we we can support each other. I hope so. To do yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you. Now, let us know how we might be able to support. Yeah. We'll send yeah. an email. Yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. Have a good retreat. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. We'll try to have some <laughs> discipline. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Atamada>. <laughs> Well, there's spiritual urgency. That's always good. <laughs> yes. Mm. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Okay, Catalina. Hello, Jesse. Hello, Michelle. So nice Hello. to be back here. Hello. <laughs> um, I have a question. I have been um um uh, working um. Just you know that I'm a, a musician, a oboe player. And I have a concert today and I had been working like for one month, so like all the time, like practicing, 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 like the whole world, like uh, is in pleasure and I'm practicing, 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 practicing. And I nail everything. I play beautiful. I like, but I feel that it's, there is a pride after, after, after the whole concert, everything, I feel like a, there is a, a lot of pride 
and 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 uh, and uh, kind of like it, my mind is still like hooking to that. Oh, it, oh wow, it was nice. Oh wow, it was great. Oh wow, and 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 I, this is all this effort. But I I also I I like um I will I I kind of like a parallel to the Dharma, knowing that is the practicing every day, practicing, practicing, practicing that can carry something like this. Uh, but I, I feel also that there is kind of a little bit of pride there. And, and I know like a, a one of the principles in this practice is not be kind of like proud, pride about the things that we gain. So if you can say something about that, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's so stressful. It's like you're even telling it's like, and she practices, and she practices, and they're like, and that you nailed it. It's like, oh, yay. That's great. You know? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Michelle, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Just, um, You've heard us say this, so it's not going to come as a surprise. But of course, of course, you would feel some pride. I mean, look what just happened and look at the amount of energy and effort you put into that and that it went well. Then the thought, the human homo sapien thought process is not going to be, you know, I hate myself for like doing a yeah. good job. Like, right? It's not, it's, it's going to be natural to they call it healthy pride. You know, there's a healthy pride that comes from that kind of effort and going well. So I think it's much more always when you look at where the teaching is, it's around identification with what's happening. That's where, so if you are feeling like that pride is yours, right? Versus just pride, pride will come and go by itself, right? But if you start feeling like it's mine, my pride, and then it starts building up an identity around it, that's when you want to look at that, right? Just like if you, it, just like if we hate ourselves and there's the opposite, then the, if, when that comes up, that it's the same, it's the same teaching, which is if there's identification with it, it's my self hatred or my feeling special or my feeling pride that it's just the same teaching so it, it kind of cuts into any kind of taking it personally but it's also of course it's going to come up and it's not something to reject it's it's just like if sadness or or joy comes up the teaching is not to reject it it's or to identify with it and get lost in it's a, it's like the sound of a bird the breath pride you know thinking pride it's just you go with the flow of it without taking it personally yeah and, thank you very, yeah. very clear like not in the identification is is right. happening yeah. It's, it's, it, yeah, it is effort and. But yeah, often, often yeah. if we're on the other side of pride, healthy pride, and we're into um, not having that, I think pride can be difficult to work with because it's so rare, right? Like often we don't know how to work with it because we don't often have it. I don't know if that's part of the thing, but it's like, this is a big deal. This is what happened. It's wonderful. Um, yeah. There's a there's a great there's a group that Jesse introduced me once called Citizen Cope, and one of their lines and one of their songs is um, happiness. Put it to your chest when it's your turn. Mm -hmm. And I really like it. It's just like it's so sweet and simple. Happiness. Put it to your chest when it's your turn. It's your yeah. turn. It's your turn. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think, you know, I 
that wholesome sense of accomplishment and you know you can it's like you can see if it starts to turn into like comparison oh i'm better than that person or i'm worse than this person like you can see how that starts to feel like unwholesome you know it doesn't feel as good in your own heart but that sense of uh, of accomplishment and and healthy pride is like it's so important to know that like we can work hard at something and accomplish something and you know that we feel good about our talents and our and our efforts and um i think just exactly what michelle said about like it's it's you know it, it happens and so the sense of how do you relate to it as it arises you know and the identification and i think in some ways there's also with vipassana there's that like the the watching the whole arc of events is always really important so that sense of you know the determination of the last month you know and where was that anxiety or was that stress where was that just commitment where was it a determination that felt really good where was it worrying that felt bad you know like it's not just one thing it's going to be this whole mix you know and where's the stress and where what's the difference between stress and excitement you know or anxiety and enthusiasm you know beforehand and then in the moment of your playing it you know it's like you know that you did everything and and then you have this high right i mean there's all kinds of aspects to that experience that are mental emotional there's physiological right there's you know all this like um chemical things that happen right in the body with this type of experience and so then it's just like the commitment has to be to keep watching right this sort of like well how long does that last and then what happens when it starts to go down you know do you start to have doubt the next day do you start to have like this 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 process that we go through in these types of performances you know is very important to watch and to be mindful of and to see oh where are we attached where are we identified where do we reject where do we not want to be identified you know all of these things it's really important and you see why it's like just like michelle said there's nothing wrong with feeling it it's when we think that's the only worthwhile experience is that high that then we need it again. Right. And then we go it again and you see, you know, they say some of these like world-class musicians, they have like real problems with anxiety and drug addiction. And, you know what I mean? There's like, it's the pressure and the stress and then the need to, to have the perfect performance and any performers, right. It's like, this can be an unhealthy cycle, right. That people go through if you're not mindful of it, if you're not aware of like, oh, of course, this is a natural good feeling that arises and it will dissipate, right? And and you go through that other stage too of like, okay, and then it fades away and still feel pride, <laughs> still feel healthy pride, still feel a sense of worthiness. I mean, sometimes we talk about it more in terms of worthiness, right? Uh, where this sense of, is your is our goodness that sense of when it's your turn is your the availability of your sense of your goodness only when we've performed perfectly or do we have access to that other times and that is like the more important work over the long haul right it's not that you don't want to feel it when you do a good job but you also want to make sure that you haven't that's not the only time that you feel it right and that you have access to it in different times you know so it's powerful yeah hmm. Really, congratulations! Ooh. Thank you. Very, very <laughs> useful. Yeah, I know. I, I know. I don't feel guilty. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, right. Very healthy in a way. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Mm. Mm.
Hi, Annie. Oh, let's see. Can you unmute there? Hi, Annie. Yes, I'm unmuted. Okay. Um, I've been crying a lot lately. And the two things that really, um, two things that I react to is, I mean, I, I know that crying is often a sign of a heart opening. You know, it's a, it's a sign of my heart opening. And I know that's some of what's happening. Um, I cry a lot um, when I experience other people's feelings. And, and I don't, I, so compassion will often make me cry. And I, I think I've mentioned this before. <laughs> But, but I'm also noticing that I cry when I read or hear a story of someone caring for someone else. And I'm thinking, I go, well, that's really a lovely thing. Um, it should be, I mean, it should be um, sympathetic joy. Um, and I don't. And I know that people cry with joy, but it doesn't exactly feel like joy. Part of it feels like um, I can't believe someone did that. I can't believe that someone rescued this person who was hanging off of a cliff. I can't believe that this dog helped another dog get across the road. I can't, there's, there's a part of me that's so overwhelmed by the things that people do and the things that animals do for one another. It's just, it's almost, it's almost too much. And it's a strange thing that I can't just experience, um, I can't just experience clear and free appreciative joy. Maybe it's because I find my crying embarrassing because I cry so much these days. I mean, it's every news story. It's hard for me to watch the news. It's hard for me to read the news. And yet I also do a lot of both. <laughs> um, so it may be because it's embarrassing that I, I can't just allow it to be sympathetic joy or appreciative joy. It's a wonderful problem. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think it's an awful, it, it's a beautiful, pro, it's a beautiful problem. You know, it's, uh, I remember I did this two month meta retreat in Australia with Seda Upandito and I was on the plane with no like integration or anything after I got right on a plane and I, I was reading a Time magazine or something and I just started crying and the stewardess came up to me and she's like are you all right and I'm like I'm fine I'm just fine like uh, you know and it was more like um somehow it's not okay to be crying right like there is that level where other people will misinterpret it so I th you know I, I think it's to me tears are wonderful no matter what they're like um, laughter, tears, laughter, they're just, it's, they're not, um, emotion is not meant to be a, a cold, rational description of an event. It's usually our system is just um, expressing all ki kinds of different um, emotions. So I, I don't, I think it could be partly the embarrassment any, I mean, I, I do think that there's a level where I'm not sure if it bothers you if if you're alone. When I'm alone and really let it go, it just feels like, oh, my God, <laughs> <It's> too much. <laughs> Because I've I've let it go and tried to explore everything that's there. And some of it is compassion and some of it is um, 
appreciative joy. And some of it is just a ton of tears. I mean, there there's probably a well of it for other reasons too, because I'm experiencing a lot of grief. Yeah, so um, it's just water. You know what I mean? Like it's water element, and it's a it's the when when one of my favorite things that Upandita did in the first retreat he did in America in '84 is he did he came in and he gave this long description that the Buddha gave of all the different reasons why there's tears. And the first reason he gave is that when we're chopping onions, I loved it. Like I think everybody was all excited about like that he was going to talk about emotion. But actually the first reason was being around somebody chopping onions. And I just laughed and laughed. I thought it was great. But there's like, just just know that you could be crying because you were smelling onions chopped. You know, there's different reasons. I mean, again, I don't, I feel like as your heart softens, for some people, tears are much more accessible. And what, I mean, Kuan Yin, the thing that is so beautiful about the Bodhisattva of compassion is that she can hear, she can hear all the laughter and all the cries, you know, and it's, I would hope that you, for me, the feeling I have in listening to you is that my hope is that you get less judgmental that it's, it's wonderful that the heart softens. And I think maybe it is the, um, if it, it, the only other thing I would say is that the Buddha did teach that the experience of overwhelm or the experience of helplessness in the face of suffering is a, is a proximate cause for the appearance of compassion. So, so I would just suggest if you feel like there's some suffering in it, in the overwhelm, that you do compassion practice for yourself. Yeah, that's helpful. Because, yeah, you mentioned it several times, that feeling of overwhelm. Um, it's the it's a beautiful teaching because again most of us are taught that overwhelm is bad or that the feeling of helplessness or overwhelm in the face of suffering is bad but he taught that it was good it was like that's the ticket to the experience of compassion so the heart the heart being numb or closed is very different than the heart being softened. And then of course at times the heart gets overwhelmed you know, with all the um, array of exposure of input that we're getting. Yeah, that's definitely overwhelming. Definitely overwhelming. I just, it, it is hard to handle the overwhelm. Every, every news story, I feel something or other, <laughs> just about. And I have to, um, I have to really be careful when I, careful about things that I take in. I even get overwhelmed. <laughs> I, was, I was meditating outside with a, um, my local sangha. I was so overwhelmed with the sound. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> and I had to, I had to shift my attention. I can get overwhelmed with the visual images too. Um, and I just, I have to shift my attention because the, it's easy for me to feel just, I mean, I almost started to panic with the sound that was coming at me from, uh, it was, and I live out in the country, so it was in town and I, I just, it was part of the overwhelm, but I'm sorry, I sort of changed the topic because, but no, it no, was I, but in I response to the overwhelm. I, I just I, think, yeah, go ahead. I mean, I have, there's so much to say about what you're saying. And I think that, um, 
Jesse, I'm sure has a lot. So I'll just say one more thing was just don't forget the two wings of a bird. There's the the compassion and the equanimity is what allows the flying. And so my recommendation is to do a lot of equanimity practice, which is often, often we forget that part. <laughs> Yes, it's <laughs> and that's, at the bottom of my list. Yeah, no, and I'd put it on the top. It's it's what it's what strengthens the softening of the heart. The softening of the heart needs to have the strength of equanimity and that deep acceptance of how things are, even if it's getting to the panic stage. It's like um, you know, you're just having to turn the voltage down. Yeah, you've got to protect yourself with less voltage, but but you also need to protect yourself. The equanimity is what's going to actually help. The mindful mindfulness is going to help. The equanimity over and over. I would really start leaning, <laughs> leaning into that equanimity strengthening part. You know, it's like I had, I was teaching a three month retreat many years ago. And I got a phone call from a yogi because this was the person who had been on staff and he had my phone number, which is not usual. And it was about two months into the three month retreat. And it was like, like three in the morning and I hear his voice, I answered the phone and he's like, Michelle. And I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to like, what? It's three in the morning, but I know he's a yogi. And I'm like, okay, what's up? And he's like, Michelle. And I was like, and he said, there's a butterfly in my room. And he's like sobbing. <laughs> and that's great. And I'm like, okay, let's, let's like, this is okay. This is another great problem, right? Like, let's not put it outside. Let's just like, it's okay. <laughs> but that's that, you see what I mean? It can get to that point. So compassion practice for the, we did compassion for the butterfly and also equanimity and then for him. And it just starts to ground it. And that it's just like that intensity, that intensity of the overwhelm, it, it, it can be balanced and grounded. And, and then you also get that you're, you're in a stage of your life and practice where you need more protection. So you're not reading the news all day, hopefully, right? Oh, no. Maybe, maybe one story every two days. Yeah. The headlines, the headlines can set me off. I mean, just the headlines, just picking something to read. But yes, I need to, I, I need to be really careful about that. But I think that practicing equanimity, which I don't do, except on retreat when, you know, I'll do it in January. <laughs> I, I can, I can hear I should be, I should be making it a regular part of the menu. I would put it really, really, really on the top. Yeah. Yeah. If the softening part is going well. <laughs> Yeah. Jesse, I'm sure you have something to say. Oh. Yeah, I do. Um I, I it's I don't want to go over too much of the same material, but there is that like that initial part of like not hearing a problem, right? It's like, you know, you're sensitive and so much of I think what so many of us are working with is that the dulling of that sensitivity as a protection, right? And so, you know, we honor that, of course, on many levels. Um, I was just thinking of that really beautiful quote that Michelle will sometimes offer from the Haida Gwaii, um, kind of epic poem about, there was like, a, the there was this, this group of boys was traveling and the song of the wren, it said it pierced a blue hole in the heart of the one who passed closest to it. And that notion of like being that sensitive, right? Of like, it's such a beautiful expression of a certain kind of sensitivity to beauty, right? Um, 
never mind everything else. So I, I think that there is, it's the sensitivity is not wrong. In fact, it's beautiful, right? It's beautiful to be touched by painful realities. It's beautiful to be touched by um, really wonderful truths, you know, that you encounter. So it's like the sensitivity isn't the problem. It's, but but really getting that, yes, you know, maybe there there is something about the stability within that sensitivity that is not fully developed yet, right? And so, you know, it's like, yes, there's nothing wrong with crying. There's nothing wrong with being moved by, like, inspiring things or horrible things, of course, you know. But I think just, you know, to kind of augment what Michelle is saying about the that is the role that equanimity plays in the Brahma Viharas is that it's not so there's two things I want to say about it it's like it, it, the encouragement yes to do equanimity practice and to explore that but not as a way of tamping down that other experience and that's what's hard it's like you're gonna there's gonna be a tendency to see like well I need to be more equanimous and I need to feel less of this and you're going to sort of this idea of bringing it in as an antidote to your sensitivity, which actually is not the point of it, right? It's like, how do you stabilize amid that sensitivity? And so there's just the, the, the main thing is that's why equanimity is present in compassion. That's why it's present in mudita. That's why it's present in metta. That's why the Brahma Viharas are they're also balanced with wisdom, right? That it's not just grief or pity. It's not just overwhelming emotion with joy, right? It is balanced through wisdom and that the equanimity is bringing that part to the compassion, bringing it to the mudita, to the loving kindness. So it's not like, is a, it's not opposed to those. It's within those, right, that it's bringing the balance and that there is a rationale for why we might explore it separately. And so the way I think can be helpful so that you're not trying to do equanimity so that you don't feel what you're feeling is that's not the way to do it, right? But there is something about, there's a reason why it's developed metta first, right? Kindness. And then you're feeling into the compassion, you're feeling into the pain of our lives and pain of the world, feeling into the joy in our lives and the joy in the world. And there, there is a way that that is, that is a natural progression, right, of the practice, of the heart's growth. But also that when you've gone through that, that you have experienced that sort of, you've opened to the fullness of the suffering, you've opened to the fullness of the joy, and that the heart comes to this just acknowledgement, right, of this is the way of things. There's great suffering. There's great joy. And there is a, a calm in that. There is a stability in that. There is a peace in the acknowledgement of that. It's not a denial of that. It's not a, a denial in the heart of that. But it's an, an acceptance of dukkha and the reality of the ups and downs, the joys and sorrows and to some degree the uncontrollability of those things right the 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 fact of those no matter you know what parts of it seem you know created by ourselves or other humans the sense of it is always arising and passing so that if you can come to the equanimity practice not as a way to as an antidote to what you're feeling again but as a way of like coming through what you're already experiencing right your sensitivity to pain your sensitivity to joy and then this like acknowledgement of this is the way things are there is great joy there's great sorrow in this world and that your heart actually can feel all of it but that there is a stability there that we can find is very important ultimately and it's it's not just important for the equanimity it's important for the what compassion actually is is a balanced caring it's it's important for what mudita actually is it's a balanced appreciation or metta, right? It's a balanced love because it's balanced with wisdom. So yeah, I definitely, you know, don't feel like you have to turn this part off. <clears throat> you don't want some degree of restraint in terms of how much you're triggering it probably is, is wise. Yeah. You know, 
but it's good to be sensitive and this isn't going to dull that it's like a refinement of that process you know that's very helpful thank you mm, yeah it's great mm. mm -hmm. Samantha. Jesse, you answered a little bit of what, whatever you said was helpful. So um, my question, I think it's about um, realms of existence that you all talk about so much. Um, and I experience so much in my practice, but um, I lately, especially when I'm very quiet, um, which I have been for the last couple of days, early morning or late night, especially, it's um, it's some thoughts. I don't know what to call them, or understanding just pops up from nowhere, and it. It's not something that I would ever, doesn't fit my way of thinking um, at all. So it's a little odd and a little, um, even shocking sometimes. Um, it's just, I don't know where it comes from. Um, sometimes it's helpful and of course, you know, I mean, this thing here, my thermal lobes, don't stop, right? They're always thinking, even when I'm trying to uh, just label it. But so I just continue. Um, sometimes it's, it's really hard to integrate it into the way I see the world. <laughs> um, because like I said, so outside of what I understand. Um, but, um, so I just go back uh, and sometimes I have to keep it outside because it's really hard to integrate. Like I said, other times, um, equanimity really helps a lot. Um, Meta towards myself, <laughs> my ignorance and inability to understand. Um, it's very helpful. Um, so I mean, I, I don't know any any advice on that. Does this make any sense, or I can ask and explain better? I mean, I, I think it may be. I mean, we can see what you know, Michelle says. It, but, I mean, it it may be helpful to hear something more specific or not. But I mean. I think to me the the most basic aspect in terms of the Dhamma that it goes back to is something Michelle was talking about kind of earlier is that has to do with like the versions of ourselves that we are most identified with and how kind of solid <clears throat> that can be and um and that when other aspects of thought or mind or you know things that are more dreamy or more surreal or <clears throat> don't necessarily fit into the kind of framework that we're used to in terms of like oh this is me doing this this is me thinking this is my perspective on things this is what i believe this is you know the things that we've kind of incorporated into the, our construction of ourselves um you know, that there are times when things that don't fit into that can be, they can feel really like illuminating, they can feel really interesting, they can just be sort of boring, they can be disturbing, you know. Um, and so there's like a whole range of what, how we might experience kind of those types of phenomena, you know, in our minds. And it so doesn't surprise me that it's, you know, when you're quieter, maybe when your guard is down a little bit more. You're not, um, you know, so the way we tend to kind of, you know, kind of control the 
the activity of the mind, right? That other stuff pops up. And especially if we're quieter and we start to notice more of the sort of like, you know, what might be kind of unconscious or not personal kind of narrative and phenomena, you know, that that occur in the mind and heart, you know, that we are, we sense it, we can get sensitive to a lot of different streams of experience, you know, um, that we don't know where they come from, you know, that might not fit into the the version of ourselves that we're constructing. And so, I mean, I think that there's, depending on the, the, the sort of breadth of all of that and the details of it and kind of, you know, what's happening in our practice and what's happening in our lives, you know, there's places where there's like the encouragement is to just, you know, it's like you just notice thinking and why are we so identified with the other thoughts that we have? We think those are us, but they're not really us either. You know, this question of exploring identification and non-identification is one way you know, sometimes if it feels like very intrusive or very difficult, there's like important to get space, you know, and to notice our emotional reaction to stuff. And, you know, we need to, you know, work with it in a different way that's kind of more protected. Um, so there's a whole range of all of that, but it's all going to kind of um, include some level of that kind of where are we curious, where is there interest, where is there this kind of experience exploration of what's you know identification where that occurs where it doesn't um what feels like we have good grounding to be kind of investigative of it what times are there places where it feels like we need to be more careful and kind of go back to just meta or you know um distract the mind in a way that's you know supportive of just kind of more stability you know i don't know does that feel like it gets at some degree of what you're kind of experiencing or kind of pointing to yeah i i think so um i guess you're saying um it's it's this it's not disturbing if i can identify that i'm identifying um with the opposite right that that's outside of me um not something I would ever think about. Um, so then there you have it. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's just a lot lately. So, um, yeah, I think uh, one of you said something in the past retreat, aversion to insight, and that kind of stuck for me as far as. Um, and you think you want to know, and you research it quick. It's like, wow, really? All of this really is okay? Um, yeah, probably not making much sense, but it's it's the size of what is acceptable, um, or the, what the heart can bear, um, is unreal. It's not like right to this of today, you know, it bearing it, right? It's here, but it's unbelievable how big it can get and how painful it can be in the extremes, right? And how joyful it can be in within seconds. I'm looking for a word that I can't quite find, um, but I think that when we get in a quieter, deeper place, um, and one one is not controlling what's appearing, then it can get um, loose. Is the word that is close to what I'm looking for, but it isn't. But it. Um, the range of the range of what can be appearing that range of pain or pleasant um the, the flexibility of mind that that uh comes from 
equanimity makes space for less and less control. And so anything can appear. I know you said it many times. I just said it. <laughs> I have said it many times. But I mean, until I see it, how is anything is really anything? It's like totally, it's like Alice in the Wonderland, anything. That's what I mean. And that I mean, is, we should be clear too to everyone. Like yeah. you're actually on self retreat right now. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> like you're, you're you're quiet. You're sitting. You know, very quiet. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the, when you see how much equanimity really can be okay with, and bear and bear, and bear it, and it's really okay, and that it just keeps being okay, and it's like, oh, you can keep being more and more okay with whatever's happening. It is astounding. I mean, it, it it and it is disorienting in a way. It's like because you you can't believe that the heart can actually be keep being more and more okay with more and more of That's reality, so which is it. more and more uncontrolled. Yeah. That's the word. Yeah, and I'm I'm not by nature a person that's disoriented. Mm -hmm. So yes, thank you. And that the disorientation can be okay. I mean, I think that's the sort of practice. I mean, you're gonna. <clears throat> It, it makes sense that you're going to hit your edge or there's going to, the mind will recoil at times, right? In this process, it's not just this sort of like opening. And in a way that's good, right? The mind needs to kind of restabilize sometimes around a kind of recoiling from the truth of things and the, and that that's okay. And that that recoiling can be folded back in of like, oh, well, that's actually okay too, right? That, that nothing actually ends up needing to disturb the equanimity, you know, in the, on its deepest level. It's crazy. It's far out. <laughs> and yeah, you know, and then, but you don't have to, don't push it and don't worry about when the mind is like, really, is this really okay? <laughs> and you're like, okay, don't, you know, doubt or whatever. It just, it comes back and it's more solid and no problem, you know? Yeah. I mean, because, you know, you do have the guard. I, I do have the guardrail of the eightfold path. And mm -hmm. sometimes if it's something outside of that, it's like, why in the world are you having that thought? You know? Um, and, and that's, I mean, that's where that's where you really have to get that the, I think the clearest sense door that we can have in terms of understanding anatta is thinking because <laughs> any thought can appear in the mind like and often when you get quiet, it's shocking, right? And so that, but that's so, it's so important is what Jesse's saying. It's like, it's not your thought, right? Glad is not mine. Right. And if there's a reaction like that to it, that's the practice of learning that that thought isn't yours. Right. It's like, really, this is no, where you get to, it's like, yeah, it's really idea. important. It's really important. Yeah. You know, Quan Yin isn't just like a statue on your desk. You know what I mean? It's like this idea that it's actually we that that the human heart is capable of feeling all of the joy and sorrow of the world and hearing it, right? That she hears all of the cries of the world, right? That actually the heart is capable of that. And not just capable of it, but capable of feeling totally steady in that and totally capable of compassion in that right, of like a balanced care in response to the agony of the world and the joy of the world and but, what, oh. the whatever of the world, right? That that's not, like that that's real. And it's not outside of us, that capacity. It's important. Hmm. And when we just have the statue, that's good enough, you know. And then when we're <laughs> when we're in it, that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everyone. Wonderful to be with you all this week. Hope you're well, taking care. Hmm. Hopefully we'll see you next Sunday.
May we be happy and peaceful of heart. Mm. Thank you.